You know, as we begin this Monday Thursday service, once again, we're reminded that this is the day, the time, the moment where Jesus was gathered with his disciples and he gave them the Lord's Supper. Now, this was the meal that Jesus gave before he goes to the garden. It's the meal he gave before he was arrested and led to the cross. And for us, this is a famous meal. But the reality is this meal was famous even before Jesus gave it to his disciples. I don't know, have you ever had a famous meal before? Anybody ever gone to one of the restaurants that's featured on a television show? Kind of a famous meal or a famous food or a famous specialty. There are all kinds of them all over the country. Greg Stiles, our our executive director, our our chief of staff, is... uh, kind of a foodie guy, and he watches those shows and then always tries to plan his stops in various towns around those kinds of restaurants because of famous meals. But there are other kinds of famous meals. In fact, uh, you probably know about these famous meals. So there's peanut butter and jelly, right. There's macaroni and there's spaghetti and Meatballs, if you, uh, if you have an Italian wife, it may have a different name than that, you know, when you think about it. Uh, there's also, for those who sort of have a, a standard fare that they love and it's what they eat day in and day out, there's meat and potatoes, right. But as I mentioned, the, the Jews also have a famous meal, and it went way back beyond that first Lord's Supper. And in that famous meal, they had bread and Now, were you tempted to say water? Yeah, it wasn't water, was it? That's a famous meal too, but we're not going to talk about that. No, it's bread and wine. And when we think about that whole idea of bread and wine, the reason that that this meal is so famous is because it's on the heels of another meal, another tradition that was already seated deeply in the hearts and minds and faith of the Jewish people. And it goes all the way back to one of the most miraculous moments in the history of Israel. It goes back to that incredible moment of the Passover. Now you remember the context, the setting for the Passover, right? The, the Jews had already been enslaved in Egypt for a long, long time, hundreds of years. They had been there and they had been praying and wanting to be delivered and lo and behold, nothing ever happened. And finally, Moses, who grew up in Pharaoh's household, flees because of something that he did. We talked about this in our Exodus series. Flees out into the wilderness and then God sends him back to confront Pharaoh and to see the people of Israel relief from their slavery. So we're in Exodus chapter 12, verse 1. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. Take care of them until the fourteenth day of the month, when all the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. That same night, they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast, the unleavened bread that we still use to this very day. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals. And I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on your houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass you over. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. Now think about this incredible scene. This is the tenth of ten plagues, right? So there have been nine plagues before this. And and throughout these plagues, these were ways that God was trying to get Pharaoh's attention, right? God sent Moses to, to set the people free, to get Pharaoh to send them out of Egypt, to release them. And lo and behold, God uses these plagues as a way of saying, Pharaoh, don't you understand? I am the true God. Your gods have no power. And if you continue, you're going to suffer. Well, lo and behold, this goes on and on and on until we get to this tenth 
play. And God has upped the ante in a profound way. And now the, the reality is that instead of, of softening and becoming more and more willing to listen to Moses, it, it tells us after each of those nine plagues, Pharaoh hardened his heart and would not I just want to keep you with me. Hardened his heart and would not let the people go. So Passover becomes this very, very famous meal, but it begins as a plague. And God tells Moses about this plague, but then he also gives him that very clear instruction about how it is that the people of Israel are to paint the the top and the sides of the houses, the doors in the houses where they're eating this Passover meal because God will pass over while he moves through Egypt and he strikes down the firstborn of people and animals where he sees the blood of the lamb. He will pass over. Well, you know what happens, right? When Pharaoh sees the devastation, he sends the people out. He lets them go, and they're able to flee their their slavery. They're able to experience freedom. Well, because it's a very special celebration, I have just one single point that I want us to focus on. Out of this whole incredible story, what I want us to focus on is that the Israelites were able to flee, to be free, because a lamb died sacrificially. Now, that brings me to a question that's very personal. Have you ever felt trapped? Have you ever felt like you were were sort of ensnared by something? Have you ever wanted to flee to be free and didn't seem like you could pull it off? You know, I remember when I was a kid. So I was the oldest of five, and my my second oldest sibling is Patty. And uh, I remember one day we were in our house. This was a time when my family was living in a suburb of the Detroit area. And uh, my my sister Patty was mad about something. I I don't remember what she was mad about. Pardon me, guys, while I get this straight. I I think it was because she had to clean her room. But she was absolutely beside herself that she would be told what to do, that she'd have to do these things that, that was expected of her, and she was having none of it. In fact, she was so outraged she was going to run away. She was going to flee the whole situation. She, she packed her little bag, and, and she was ready to go. Now, remember, we're little. We're not very old, and we're not very big. And I'm watching all of this happen, and I'm watching my parents engaging with her in this conversation about her running away, and them saying, well, if you think you can find a better place, if you can find a better program, go ahead. And I'm, my eyes are huge. It's like, I don't think this is a good idea. I remember Patty in her fit walking out the front door and walking down the steps. And, you know, I remember one of my parents went over to the door. It had to be my mom to, to watch her. And I remember my dad was sitting there, and he was just kind of laughing. And I'm looking, and he realizes that I'm scared. And, and he leaned forward, and he said in a very quiet voice, It's okay. She's not going far. And I thought to myself, how can he know that? I remember getting up and running over to the door and watching as my sister is taking off. She's, she's running away. She got to the end of our little, our little walkway up to our house, and she started walking down the sidewalk, and she got about to the middle of our front yard. And she stopped. And then totally against her will, She turned around and came marching back in the house. Now, she couldn't get away, right? She didn't have the ability. She didn't have the power. She didn't have the resources. She didn't have the know-how. She could not get free from this horrible affliction of parental supervision. But you know, 
sometimes it's not funny, right? Sometimes it's not just a childish game. Sometimes you and I are dealing with things and we just can't get free. Sometimes sin is so sneaky. It, it's so alluring that it, that it ensnares us. And before we even realize what's going on, we're trapped. That's what John tells us. In John chapter 8, verse 34, Jesus' words, Very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is what? Is this the, the 6 o'clock in the morning service? Everyone who sins is a a slave to sin. Let that, let that sink in for just a minute. Because as I, I look in this room, I see a lot of beloved people. And every one of us sins. So unless Jesus has got it wrong, every one of us is a slave to sin. Is there any way to get free? Is there any way to flee that snare? Well, so when it comes to this celebration of Jesus at the Passover with his disciples, I I want you to notice something because I think there's hope in the midst of all of this. As we read through the story Do you remember how the whole thing went? There was a lamb, there was bread unleavened, there were bitter herbs, right? And that's the the Passover meal. Well, listen to the story as Jesus celebrates with his disciples. This is in Matthew 26. While they were eating this Passover meal, Jesus took bread And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood, the covenant which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. That's it. That's the whole description of the meal, the Passover meal that Jesus is having with his disciples. Now, are you comparing that to the, to the instructions about Passover in the Old Testament? Do you notice that something is missing? What's missing? I'm hearing it, I think. The lamb is missing. There's no lamb ever mentioned as being at or or being on this table. But it's not an oversight. It's not a mistake. The fact of the matter is the gospel writers are helping us to get focused on the reality that there is no lamb on the Passover table because when it comes to the Lord's Supper, the lamb is sitting at the table. The lamb is serving the meal. Do you remember what John the Baptist called Jesus? In John chapter 1, verse 21, look, the Lamb of God who does what? Takes away the sin of the world. So on this Passover night, literally the Lamb of God is getting ready to be sacrificed and he's being prepared to be sacrificed for our sin. He's preparing to save the whole world. He's preparing to offer himself. Now, here's the question I want you to ask. When it comes to this whole idea, there's one more parallel that's really striking. After the Israelites put the blood on the the doorposts, after the lamb was sacrificed, God passes over, and what happens? They're set free, aren't they? They flee. 
There's an interesting parallel that that you find in the New Testament account of, of all of the events that we're observing during Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, and Easter. And it goes like this. After Jesus finishes the Passover meal and, and he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray, when he finishes praying, what happens? He's arrested. And what do the disciples do? All the disciples deserted him and fled. They ran away. Now, you might be inclined to think, well, wait a minute. The disciples, they ran away. They left him at his moment of great and profound need. But I want you to realize something. They're not condemned for running away. They're allowed to run away. Because, you see, they have no part in the sacrifice The lamb is what's required. It's the lamb who is going to die to set them free. You know, dear friends, what do you need to flee? What is it that's ensnared you that's holding on? Maybe it's a regret. Maybe it's guilt from, from something in the past. Maybe it's an addiction or a bad habit that that just has a hold on you. Maybe it's hurt from something that happened to you. Maybe it's fear. We live in a time of such tremendous fear. What is it that's got a hold of you and won't let you flee? Because I want you to understand something. Monday, Thursday is a reminder that nothing has power to enslave you anymore. Anything that you need to put down, anything that that you need to get free of, it has been accomplished. That strength of sin, that strength of pain, that strength of guilt, those burdens that we carry, all of those have been broken by the blood of the Lamb. In fact, I love what it says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. Read it with me, will you? It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. What's Paul saying? You and I, through the blood of the Lamb, Jesus, have been set free. And so as you come a little later in this service to this table, Come with all of your burdens. Come with all of your snares. Come with all of the things that hold on to you. And when you leave this table, know that you leave them behind. That even as you and I are eating and drinking the bread and wine, Jesus is taking all of that to the cross. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we are grateful that you love us, that you have given us this wonderful, wonderful celebration. And we are grateful that in the midst of it, it's not just a story that we remember. It is a truth that we cling to. It's a message that sets us free. Lord, bless us and strengthen us that as we leave this table, we would also leave behind anything that holds on to us, anything that burdens us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.